Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we are going to draw this fishing float using watercolor and pencil. And this is available in a real-time lesson that's a little over two hours long over in Critique Club. If you are interested in that, there'll be a link in the video description and you can go check that out. I used a compass to draw the circle that would be the fishing float, and now I'm just using a pencil to sketch in um, the knot there and this trail of rope that's going to go um, off the float. So the fishing fishing floats are basically a glass globe and they were used in Japan. Fishermen would anchor them to the top of their nets and when they threw them in the water, it would keep the top of the nets floating so they could retrieve them. And then um, once they had pulled in their float, they would... Um, they would cut them free because it would be more important to bring the fish back and the floats were pretty much disposable. They were made from recycled sake bottles, so they weren't a valuable thing back then, but man, if you want to go buy one now at an antique mall, you are going to pay a pretty penny. A couple seconds ago, you saw a watercolor of a rope that I had done for World Watercolor Month, and that was one of the inspirations of this piece. I wanted to do um, more with the rope, and I thought it would be kind of fun, and plus I just love the fishing floats, and I want to learn more about them because I see them in antique malls every once in a while and they're just so pretty you can actually buy replica ones made um like at a oh, probably christmas tree shop and tj maxx and stuff like that if you want to decorate with them and you don't care if they're authentic um the authentic ones sometimes you'll find water trapped in them because they um they will have gotten trapped in like arctic ice and they will um they will take in they'll be like tiny tiny little pores that will take in some water and there's often often a imperfections and um you know weird thicknesses in the bottles because they're they were very hastily made from old sake bottles and you know it wasn't important that they were perfect or beautiful because they were just going to be disposed of and there's still fishing floats circulating in the ocean they get trapped in the i guess north pacific rift and um and they wash up every you know every now and then usually in alaska in western canada and uh washington and oregon so um you know hey if you're ever on a beach near the ocean up there you may find a treasure i've never seen anything like that sometimes i'll find some beach glass here in maine but i've never found any treasures like that i think that's pretty pretty awesome um and sadly probably future generations will only find our plastic crap washed up from the ocean um but it just a treasure like that is, is kind of kind of neat so i wet the area that was going to be the sky and the water and do you see my horizon line there that's really a little too dark and i'll show you how i deal with that in a little bit but i'm using naples yellow and the watercolors i'm using are my core watercolors uh, with world watercolor month i've kind of been um you know just kind of re reviving love of my old favorites and bringing out paints I haven't used in a while and these are really wonderful the thing I would say about the core watercolors is that they have probably more flow than other brands so if you want a paint that really just kind of whooshes off your brush and flows and spreads uh, I would definitely consider the core watercolors now the core watercolors can be quite expensive with the exception of the um six 12 and 24 tube sets those are actually quite affordable so um i started off with the six high chroma colors which is probably my favorite set that they offer and you can get that for around 22 bucks like at uh at blick or jerry's or even amazon um and there's three sets of six where you will get no duplicate colors there's like earth tones the uh, traditional and the high chroma set and then there's a 12 and 24 which will have some duplicates from those first six sets i think what i ended up doing was um or maybe it's just a 12. I think it's 24. I think I did, did the uh, the six sets, and then I either bought the 12 or the 24. I can't remember. I think it was the 24. I think it was around $71. But um, uh, but the, the paints are fantastic. They're five milliliter tubes in that, so they're small paints, but they go a long way. They use a different binder. They use Aquazol, which is uh, instead of gum arabic, which has been used in conservation, like art conservation for decades. Um, and it's a very small binder. So when they dry down, they dry down small, hard, but they rewrite really well. So if you've got like a shallow um, travel palettes, I wouldn't hesitate using the core paints in your travel palette. Even if you live in a humid area, like Maine gets pretty humid in the summer. I haven't had any migration with the core paints. They seem to dry down really well. I do give them a good spray before I use them, especially like the cobalt violet because that is a tough to re-wet color but other than that I mean I find them to be a, a lovely paint that I should really quite frankly use more often um, and I then added some, um, so the colors I've used so far, I used some cobalt teal and cobalt turquoise. I bought the, a big tube of the cobalt turquoise because I thought that um, I liked the cobalt teal so much that, you know, I already had some, so I got the turquoise. I like the cobalt teal better. It's a much cleaner color. The cobalt turquoise is more... Um, 
it's a dirtier color. I guess it's the best way to, to describe it. But since I did use some in the water, I wanted to keep using it to kind of um, uh, cross-pollinate those colors. I added some burnt sienna and raw sienna into the sand area, and I did sprinkle some salt into the... Um, into the, the sandy area just to get a little more texture. And I also flicked on some paint just to give a little more texture in the salty area. So now we're going on to the fishing ball itself. And that's that, that's the cobalt turquoise right there that I'm adding in. And I wanted to use it because um, a lot of times with those with authentic fishing floats, they're not a clear glass. They get etched from all the salt and the sand and the tumbling in the water. Cause I mean, they're, they'll be out in the water for like a decade or more before they wash ashore. So they've gotten some weathering to them. So I wanted it to have that kind Kind of less than transparent look. I want it to be kind of like etched and translucent looking. So that's why I decided to go with the, the effects of that granulating color. Anytime you're working with a cobalt color, you're generally, or, or actually um, mineral-based inorganic pigments, you are you have a higher chance of having granulating color. So I really wanted to get that kind of etched look, so I chose the, uh, the cobalt colors there. Uh, but for vibrancy, I'm using some um, green gold or azo green gold. It's a, just a very vibrant, um, almost, I wouldn't say neon, but it's very transparent, very vibrant. So I can mix it with those more granulating sedimentary colors and still have that uh, that kind of um, richness and luminosity that glass would have. So that's why I'm choosing those colors. It's an odd palette, um, but I, I, you know, it's fun to experiment with colors that you typically wouldn't use. And I think maybe um, that's probably why I don't use this core palette as often as others, just because the, the selection of colors I have is kind of strange because other than, let's see, cobalt violet, cobalt, turquoise, and I think there might be a quinacridone coral or something like that. Other than those three, I've just been using colors from the sets. And the sets are pretty well balanced. Um, in fact, I'd probably recommend that you just go with one, one of the larger ones. Um, although there's some that you only... its They're a lot cheaper per milliliter. They're a lot cheaper in those intro sets. Plus you get the cool tins. Um, you can see the tin that I'm mixing in. That's one of the tins. I think that's a tin the 24 set came in. Or the 12 set, man, I cannot remember. <laughs> I, I think it must be, yeah, it's a 24 set that I got that tin in. But all the sets used to come in those big tins like that. And I use them to store all sorts of paint sets. So it's. It, I wish they kept those big tins on those. But some artists complained that they took up too much space for those uh, six tiny tubes. So they made the tin smaller, which was kind of too bad because those big tins were where it was at. I really, really like all the space for mixing and for adding new colors. And then what I do is I have magnets on the bottom of my half pans and my full pans there. And then I just bring over the colors I'm actually using onto the tin that has the divots for mixing. So uh, it works out really well for me. Um, and you can do that pretty inexpensively. You can find magnet tape or magnet bu bu button magnets that have the adhesive on the back. Now, see those dark lines I'm putting in there in the wet paint? I'm doing this in the wet paint so the lines will be soft. But what it is to represent is the netting on the back side of the... Um, uh, of the ball. So, you know, it's a transparent ball, translucent, even though it's got the etching from the sand and surf, you can see through it. Now, I was annoyed by my pencil line, so I used an eraser and I was able to erase the pencil line. I also erased off some of that pigment there, and I think it's because it was mainly the cobalt teal and cobalt turquoise, which are sedimentary colors, and those colors tend to sit on top of the paper rather than soak in. Your quinacridones, your thalos, uh, those colors seep into the paper fibers, and that's why they stain. So, um, if you erased over them, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't have, you know, lifted up the color. Now I'm just kind of using some of the sludge from my palette to make a kind of a neutral tone there. And I'm also relying on the um, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna to get some, uh, to get some grays as well. But I wanted my rope to be colorful like the sketch I had done in my sketchbook for World Watercolor Month. And if you're curious about any of my World Watercolor Month sketches, this one I did for the, the prompt abandoned, uh, you can find them on my Instagram page. It's, I'm just Lindsay Wyrick on Instagram. And I don't think you have to be a, like, I don't think you have to have an account to see it. In fact, I think if you scroll down um, in the video description, down to where I have my social media links, I think you can just click on the Instagram one and see what I have posted. I don't think you have to be logged in or anything, because um, I know not everybody uses Instagram. Uh, but it's been so fun. I love a monthly challenge, and this is a good one to do for me, because I like watercolor. I'm adding some Naples yellow uh, and also some cobalt teal into the rope, because I think that represents the kind of patina that you get on, on nautical scenes. I, I, I don't know. I don't think it would be algae, because it's probably seaweed that gets that stains the ropes, and also you get that kind of 
patina from the um, the salts in the water. And so I love to get those purples and those uh, teals and greens and yellows and stuff into my rope. I like to have a colorful neutral, and that's what I'm doing here. And I'm also using a piece of a cut up credit card to scrape in the detail of the uh, fibers of the rope. Um, so it's it's giving some actual both visual texture and physical texture. So once you've scraped into wet paper like that, you've actually made little scribes in the paper surface. So it's no longer that virgin paper. And anytime you paint over it, it's gonna seep in to those scribes more than the regular paper. So you've actually damaged the paper when you do that, but it gives you a beautiful texture and um, it really helps you create the effect of a weathered rope or other weathered things. I use it for um, for grasses and texture on tree, tree trunks, tree bark, that sort of stuff. But just know that it is a permanent, um, it's a permanent, uh, deviation on the paper. So you're not going to be able to get back to a, you know, a smooth surface. You're not going to be able to scrub those texture lines out. If I scrub over them for a highlight, it's still going to leave paint in the crevices and I'm still going to have that texture there, which is really handy for doing things like weathered rope. Uh, but just keep in mind, you are basically damaging the surface of that paper. Now I'm adding some shadow under the, like I have a couple of pieces of sea glass and a pebble in the foreground, I'm adding shadow under the rope. Now I've got my fishing ball with a little bit of sand in front of it, so it's not gonna have a shadow in front of it because it's kind of nestled in a, the sand, like a divot of sand a little bit. So I'm just kind of using my imagination to figure out where the sand will be. So to do this painting, I couldn't find a reference photo that was what I wanted that was a commercial use. So um, what I did was I found a bunch of different reference photos of sand just and um, uh, beach grass and I looked at the Wikipedia page for fishing floats that's how I um, have all that knowledge about fishing floats <laughs> from the Wikipedia page um, actually I thought I because you see them in Maine touristy shops all the time so I thought they had something to do with lobster nothing to do with lobster fishing it's all Japanese fishing um, but uh, but yeah, I couldn't find a reference photo that I liked, so I went heavily on memory. I went with my rope uh, sketch that I did the other day for World Watercolor Month as far as the um, the texture, and I kind of looked at a few pictures of floats on the Wikipedia page. It was like a big like um, like bin of floats there and just kind of approximated everything and made it up as I went along. So, you know, if you have a great reference photo, I wish I had taken some pictures of fishing floats last time I was at an antique mall, but I didn't think about that. Um, so yeah, it, all you gotta do is make some things realistic, um, like the sand and the rope and stuff like that, and you can kind of fudge the rest of the details. As long as you have some things that look plausible, then, um, and then there you go. It's kind of like somebody that lies. As long as they get some of the details right and that some of the details are truthful, then it makes you believe, I guess, the, the lies. I don't know. <laughs> It sounds like I'm a lawyer, doesn't it? Um, so here I'm scraping that same detail into the rope. And I like this part here because the rope is thicker and I can get a little more detail and I can uh, play with the colors a little bit more. Honestly though, you could use whatever watercolors you have. You don't have to have these core watercolors. The rope that I did in my sketchbook, I did with the um, Paul Rubens Phosphor Phosphorescent set, which has a little bit of shimmer to it, which I thought was really pretty. But that's upstairs on my, um, on my kind of play art desk and I was filming down here in my studio, obviously. Now you can also substitute raw sienna for yellow ochre. If you don't have raw sienna, um, you can use um, raw sienna or yellow ochre plus white if you don't have Naples yellow. So, you know, just, um, you can approximate that. The Naples yellow in the corset is made with PBR24, which is a uh, lovely, lovely Naples yellow. Um, I really like their Naples yellow. I like the Turner Naples yellow too. It does a pretty color. I always thought it was kind of like a, waste of a color to have in your palette because a lot of times it's made with yellow ochre and white but um it's such a beautiful soft color that is very flattering i find in a lot of um in a lot of situations especially if you like to do beach and nautical scenes it's just a very soft um, nice color it's also nice for like highlights and skin tones um, and even mixing into skin tones if you need a little bit more of a creamy skin tone if you want it less um less luminous you want it more peaches and cream type um, type skin. I'm um, painting the rock here. I just wet the rock and then I put in my mix of of um, uh, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna and then I'm wiping out some of it because it just was too dark and kind of um, uh, pulled the attention away from the other elements in the scene. So, you know, sometimes you got to do that for balance. You adjust the value of something. I love using purples for the shadow. In fact, I will mix, I will mix a purple with ultramarine blue and the, um, I've been using quinacridone red to make my 
purples. And then I'll add the then I'll add a little burnt sienna and a little more blue usually. And then also I'll have a purple tinted shadow that I think works really well in this. Um, and again, don't forget to do your scraping with the credit card scraper when your paint is wet. So therefore you will get those details. If you do it when it dry, when it's dry, you're not going to get the effect. Um, and if you use the end of a paintbrush rather than using a credit card scraper, it almost acts like a squeegee and pushes the paint out of the way. So that's a really great technique for like tree branches in the distance or tree trunks in the distance, but it doesn't work as well for um, getting those really sharp, dark lines. So when you want a dark line, you got to scrape when it's really wet and that will give you the best, uh, the best effects. Uh, I highly, uh, I heavily used layering in this painting and I took breaks as I was working, letting it dry, stepping away, coming back was really helpful in the process, especially since I didn't have a reference photo to rely on. Now I'm imagining the light coming through that uh, translucent glass ball and I realized it would be color on the sand. So I'm using the, um, I'm using the green gold, I'm using the blues that I had used, and I think I actually brought in a brighter yellow, um, like a, I think I used cadmium yellow light or cadmium yellow primrose. There are some nice cadmiums in these, uh, these core sets, which I really like. I like cadmium paints. Um, I know there's been a lot of, uh, I don't even know, it's kind of, I don't know, I've, I've seen like Winsor Newton has come out with their cadmium free colors, which I'm just like, and they're charging like quite a high price for it. I'm like cadmium free, come on, just call it cadmium hue because that's what it's always been, has been cadmium hue. And then, you know, they charge less for it because they're not using the expensive cadmium. So I think it's kind of a marketing ploy and I'm not here for it. And plus, um, Kimberly Crick, Crick did a, uh, did some light fast testing and some of those cadmium hues are not light fast so they don't disclose the pigment information and it's um I don't know I think it's fishy uh, so I, I I use cadmium colors I don't think there is um you know a big danger I don't eat or drink in my studio typically you know you just want to make sure you treat it like a top like a you know you just be careful use it as it's intended and you don't eat drink or smoke when you're painting and you should be fine um with using the cadmium or cobalt paints. Now here I'm lifting off color to give it that etched look and I'm making sure I have color next to the netting because a lot of times the netting would protect the fishing floats from that etching, um, the etching effects of the water and the sand and stuff. So, you know, people would find these old floats and they take the netting off and they would see unetched areas. You'd see that pattern that wasn't etched. And in fact, that's probably a way you could tell whether you have an authentic one or whether you have a reproduction. Um, I think price would probably give it away. But sometimes, you know, in these antique malls, especially in the touristy areas, I see reproductions. Um, I, I mean, I see them. I see a lot of reproductions. I, I you know, I'm not... If I'm buying something, I'm buying it to use it to, to or as decoration. I'm not buying it as a collector's item. But still, you know, I don't want to pay collector's item vintage prices for something that was made in a factory like two months ago. Uh, so it's just a way you can um, you can kind of tell. I'm sure there's ways for them to fake it too, but uh, I don't think they go through that effort generally. And I'm enhancing some of my shadows there because you've got shadows and you've got the darker glass under the netting. And again, I'm just kind of using what I know about the fishing floats, what I learned on the Wikipedia page to inform how I'm painting it. Like, it's like, how would this, how would this look sitting on the beach? How would it look if it's been tossed by the waves for decades? Um, and using that kind of logic along with the aesthetics of what I'm looking to get with this painting. And if you might notice right now, I feel like the painting is looking quite, um, quite stark, quite minimal. So I'm going to actually put in some, um, some grasses here and I'm using the green gold mixed with a little burnt sienna. I'm adding in some raw sienna here and there. I want to make sure that I have a variety of nice earthy tones and the brush I'm using is called a dagger brush. This is a dagger brush that is uh, sold for decorative artists. It's actually by Lowell Cornell. It's a comfort grip, I believe. And I like the ones that are meant for the decorative artists because they're golden taclon and they'll hold more pigment and less water. And then you'll have those nice, um, you'll have those nice full, fully pigmented um, strokes of grass. Now, Princeton Neptune does make a dagger. I have some of those too, but I find them too floppy and they hold too much water and I get, weaker colors when I'm doing grasses. They're really good for doing lots of like long lines, but as far as like doing a thick grass like that, I highly recommend a golden tacklon and you can have those for like around $34. 
at any craft store. Just look where they sell like the craft acrylics and you should be able to find those, no problem. Actually, you can usually find lots of really fun special effects brushes that will work great with your watercolor in the decorative arts section of your craft store where they sell like the bottles of craft paint. You can find uh, stiplers, you can find foliage brushes, um, you can find rakes and fans and um, lots of different golden tacklon brushes that will be ideal for your watercolor. You can even get short filberts in with the uh, in the golden tacklon brushes and those are great for scrubber scrubbers because they're gentler than the brushes that are often sold as scrubbers for painters which can actually peel your paper a little bit i also like the menta scrubbers those are probably my favorite ones and those are sold and you can usually find them in like your big box craft and art stores like michael's AC Moore used to sell them. I think Joanne, some Joannes have them, and they are just wonderful because they are a short-haired filbert golden tacklon brush, and they work really well for lifting up uh, pigment without damaging your paper. Now here I'm going in with a small round synthetic. This is actually, this came in a uh, watercolor kit, the uh, Pagos watercolor kit that I reviewed a couple weeks ago that was a very inexpensive, but the brushes that came free in that kit, or I guess part of the kit, were excellent. And um, I'm using that for those smaller little grasses where I want, you know, just kind of a thinner, they kind of like the dead dried grasses. And now that everything is dry, I'm going in and I'm using a white color pencil just to catch the texture on the tops of the rope and give me a nice gritty looking um, highlight. I want it to look kind of frayed and color pencil will do great if you just use very little pressure on top of the paper, especially where you've scratched it, you're going to get that wonderful um, kind of frayed weathered look. And the color pencil is not going to go into those scribed lines or even cover over the scribed area because it is deep. If you've made a deep valley in the pencil, in the um, paper, so the pencil can't touch it. And I'm using a little bit of a dark brown to just enhance some of my shadows where I felt it wasn't quite dark enough, but I wanted to keep that gritty texture. And so a color pencil is great because it's going to hit the tips of the uh, mountains and valleys in your paper. It's going to hit those raised areas in your rough, in your cold pressed paper, and it's going to give you a nice natural. Um, a nice natural textured shadow, which is what I want. And now um, this was a little scary to do, I gotta say, because I reasonably liked the way the glass was looking, but I also knew I could make it a little bit better. So I'm adding some frosted looks with the white. I'm adding some lemon yellow for a little bit of the light kind of getting trapped in the globe and shining out. Um, and I'm going just kind of dancing around here and there with a little, a little at a time because I was really afraid after like two hours of work that I was going to mess it up. And here where I felt, thought it was a little too stark, I'm going in with a little more paint. Um, you can erase a little bit if you do get too much pencil down. You can press a needed eraser down and kind of lift up some of it. But you do have to be careful because because um, you can overdo it and uh, you know you could also even leave a little bit of a streak or a residue or flatten down the tooth of the paper and end up with issues getting more to stick. So now I'm getting brave. I'm going a little bit firmly with my pencil and getting those, um, those more robust highlights and I feel like I'm really getting a um, uh, more volume to it but I did make a mistake on that one in the lower right hand corner and you can see I'm trying to erase it now with my eraser I made it look like it had a bubble in it I didn't like that although you will find deformities on the authentic fishing floats because they'll be like thicker thicker parts from the sake bottles that just kind of show up they also press makers marks into them um, so it's not going to be a perfect sphere anyway but that to me looked very uh, it looked kind of like have you ever seen like a soccer ball where you know it's been like pierced and you've got this kind of like bubble coming out of the soccer ball like if your dog's got a hold of it or something that's kind of what it looks like to me and now it's like i can't unsee it um I'm going in with some kind of like a lime green and adding some, look, it's almost like I'm trying to push it back. <laughs> it's bugging me. Um, I'm just going in and, and trying to bring up the luminosity a little bit without losing the etched quality of the glass. And I just want to make it kind of sweeten it up a little bit, make it look a little bit more how my mind's eye envisions it. And finally, I'm going in with a black pencil. I'm giving in any really, really dark shadows I want, like outlining, underlining, I should say, some of the ropes where you'd have the darkest contrast, that darkest shadow, where like the rope and the glass meet. Um, and basically just, uh, I'm going with a sharp, very sharp pencil because I don't want to put too much in there. And whenever I go in with a new color, I also try to add it here and there so it makes sense. So I might put some underneath a rock, just a very slight sliver, um, a little bit at the bottom of that rope just to kind of bring the things I want to be in focus and to have the most attention. I want to give it that, uh, that little darkest area, that highest contrast. And, um, 
and bring that out. And now a little uh, kind of like a, I guess it's kind of like a cream. I was going to say yellow ochre, but it's, I think the color is actually sable in Prismacolor. Uh, adding a little bit of pinks. Basically any color that I see that I like that I want to enhance, I will go in with a color pencil. And man, you just can't beat a Prismacolor for going over a color pencil. It just, uh, going over watercolor rather, it just has a beautiful um, opacity that will hold up. But yet it is translucent enough that you can see the colors underneath. Sorry about my big old head in the way there. <laughs> and I'm enhancing the grass a little bit with some um, darker green. I think it's called foliage actually, uh, Prismacolor pencil. And um, yeah, we're just about wrapping it up here. I'm just tweaking here. Nothing, um, nothing you even have to do if you don't want to. It's um, all just deciding, just adjusting values, adjusting colors. Very, very minimal stuff is going on the paper at this point. And um, if you don't want to add a color pencil to yours, that's totally fine. You don't have to. You can keep it a traditional watercolor uh, by reserving your white highlights. If you want really bright highlights like on the rope, you can scrape with an X-Acto, but you can bring in texture that way. So there's many ways to get the effects with the media that you have. So don't feel like you have to do exactly what I'm doing if you prefer to keep it a traditional watercolor. But there you have it. Um, I'm really happy with how this came out and I hope you enjoyed this time lapse. Don't forget there is a real time version of this in Critique Club. You can find that at lindsayweirick.teachable.com and I will link it in the video description. Thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate it and I hope you enjoyed this lesson. You can let me know what you think in the comments below. Have you ever seen these fishing floats before? Have you, uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, they're fun. They're beautiful. I love glass objects anyway. And I have a glass class if you want to learn how to paint glass as well. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.